to BC. Thank you for joining me today as we continue our walk through Isaiah this fall for our adult Sunday school classes. I'm really excited about our chapter for this week. We get to meet King Hezekiah and I think it's going to be a really good conversation for your small group. So let's go ahead and pray as we get started. God, I thank you so much for today and I thank you that we can gather together and open your word and I pray that as we do that, God, that you will speak to our hearts, that you will teach us more about you and more about how you are at work in the world um, among people, God, and how you've been at work throughout history, how you continue to be at work, God. I pray that we will notice you and um, we will learn from you, God. We love you so much. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said, we're going to be in Isaiah 37 as we continue our journey this fall. And I'm really excited because we've come to a, a somewhat unique um, and interesting passage here. So um, as we've been walking through, we've come to this part um, about Hezekiah. And we've had, we've gone through oracles against all the different nations. We've seen King Ahaz. Uh, make the choice to trust other nations instead of trust God. We've, and like I said, we had the oracles and then we had this series of woes. And we have come to this place here. Um, and it is going to give us a story of King Hezekiah of Judah. And one of the unique things about this section is that there's a considerable amount of overlap with Second Kings. And so I, Hezekiah's story can be found here in Isaiah 36 through uh, 39, and it can also be found in 2 Kings 18 through 20. And I encourage you to take a look at both and to read the whole section. But today we're going to be focusing on Isaiah 30, 37, and we're going to be focusing in on um, a few verses, 14 through 20 and 30 through 35, specifically taking a look at Hezekiah's prayer and God's response to that. But before we do that, I wanted to take a second and set our uh, chapter today and our conversation today in, in its context. So as I said, chapter Isaiah 36 through 39, we get the story of Hezekiah and how um, he is faced with this similar question, trust God or trust other nations. And as we've walked through Isaiah this far, like I said, we've had, we've had the example of Ahaz and how he gave the wrong answer to that question. And um, that did not go well for him. And we saw um, in several different places how um, Isaiah is building this case that trusting the nations is foolish. Only trusting God is, is um, wise because all of the other nations are made of humans and they're under God's judgment as well. And so here we have Hezekiah and his, he is faced with this same question, trust God or trust in other nations um, or um, to just give up completely. So we can set this around 701 BC and we can date it to that based off of our biblical records and also the Assyrian records. We have King Sennacherib of Assyria and he is mentioned here. And when he uh, came to power, we have Hezekiah had decided to rebel against him. And so we had that whole thing had happened. That's already happened by this point. And then, and several other places had also wanted to rebel. And so Sennacherib's having to go around and um, bring all of those um, rebellious nations back under his control. And so at first Hezekiah pays gold to Sennacherib. And so we have that information in 2 Kings and, and we get 2 Kings 18, 7. It talks about how Hezekiah, Hezekiah rebelled and then he shortly thereafter paid gold to the king of Assyria to try to keep him from continuing to attack them. And so that's all already happened. And so Sennacherib at this point is going around and attacking all of these different towns around Judah and the, we get this story of how he sent several like delegations to Jerusalem to try to bring Hezekiah in line before they launched their siege on Jerusalem. And so 
Judah's already being under attack, but Jerusalem is next. And so these fir this first delegation comes, and we get that um, story recorded here in Isaiah 36. And we have the one of his high, Sennacherib's high commanders comes and brings this story, this um, message from the king of Assyria. And he brings this message and, and um, says it in Hebrew instead of Aramaic. And Aramaic was the diplomatic language of the day. So countries or nations would deal with each other using Aramaic as the common language versus whatever the language was of those individual um, nations. But he was speaking in Hebrew. And so everybody who was out on the walls of Jerusalem could hear this message. And he is telling them why they should not trust Egypt to help them because Egypt is going to fall. And he said that they shouldn't trust God because Hezekiah has torn down all those high places because Hezekiah was a good king. And he tore down all of those places where the people were worshiping idols and he tore all of those down. But to us, to the Assyrian king, that looks like weakness because gods want more places to be worshiped. They don't want less. And so he points that out and definitely exposes not quite understanding their God, the one true God and how worship of God, the God of Israel works. And so we had that whole thing and he says, you shouldn't trust Hezekiah because he's lying to you. So you have that whole showdown. And so Hezekiah's advisors go back and tell him everything that was said. And Hezekiah immediately sends them to Isaiah and Hezekiah himself puts on sackcloth and goes to the temple. And so then his advisors go and talk to Isaiah and um, Isaiah tells them to not be afraid because um, the words that these underlings of the king of Assyria have said are, are blasphemous. They blasphemed God and that um, they, don't worry about it. God is going to deliver. So at this point, the delegation from Assyria leaves and returns to the, to the king, to King Sennacherib. And then they, the whole Assyrian army is pulled away and they are forced to divert their attention because they are about to be attacked by the king of Cush. And so before they leave though, they send another message to Hezekiah and with this, with this, um, with this word. And I'm going to go ahead and read it. It's outside of our text for, um, for today, but I'm going to go ahead and read it and say, say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, do not let the God you depend on deceive you when he says, Jerusalem will not be given into the hands of the king of Assyria. Surely you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the countries, destroying them completely. And will you be delivered? Do the gods of the nations that were destroyed by my predecessors deliver them? The gods of Gozan, Haran, Rezeph, and the people of Eden who were in Tel Asar? Where is the king of Hamath or the king of Arpad? Where are the kings of Lair, Sephar? Sepharvayim and Hena and Eva. So that is what the message is that's sent to Hezekiah the second time. And so that was Isaiah 37, 9 through 13. So it's the part right before our text. And so I, Hezekiah has just received this letter. And so what we're going to read is what he does next. And so our text today is Isaiah 37 and verses 14 through 20 and 30 through 35. So we're going to read 14 through 20 first, and then we're going to talk about it, and then we'll read 30 through 35 in a few minutes. Isaiah 37, 14 through 20. This is Hezekiah's response to receiving this letter from King Sennacherib. Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to all the words Sennacherib has sent to ridicule the living God. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste all these peoples and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them. For they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord our God, 
Deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, Lord, are the only God. So Hezekiah's response to receiving this rather threatening letter from the king of Assyria is to immediately go straight to the temple and pray. He goes and he lays this letter out before the Lord and he talks to God about it. And he, uh, I love this picture of Hezekiah coming to God and the view that we have, his view of God that we get, this glimpse of what he thinks about God. He talks about um, how he points out that God is the God of Israel, the one who is enthroned between the cherubim. He's the only God. He's the maker of heaven and earth. And he also trusts God in verse 17 to hear him. He says, open your eyes, Lord, and see. And he says, I know that you hear me. See these words of this letter from Sennacherib that has been sent to ridicule you. And so he is very concerned that God has been ridiculed, that God has been, uh, the name of God has been trampled in the dirt and that um, their people are not seeing who God is and that he is not being glorified in the way that he should be. And so he, uh, next Hezekiah goes on and he says, it's true the Assyrians have devastated everybody in their path and they've destroyed all of the gods of all of these different peoples that they have conquered. But those gods were just made out of wood and stone and they were made by people. So Hezekiah is setting out his view that God isn't destroyable. God wasn't created by humans. It's very obvious the Assyrians don't understand anything about who God is, the one and only God. They don't know who they're messing with. And you really get that sense here that Hezekiah responds with such faith in this God who he worships. I mean, he's described in 2 Kings 18 as a good king who followed God wholeheartedly who tore down all of the idols and the places where people sacrifice to idols of the, of the land. And he followed God wholeheartedly, but that doesn't mean he was perfect. And I think we see a little bit of a of growth here in Hezekiah between these two visits from the Assyrian commanders. We see a Hezekiah who grows from needing to send an envoy to Isaiah to make sure he understands what is going on and wanting to talk to Isaiah about it, to going to God himself and sitting down and saying, God, I know you're going to hear me. God, I know you can see this letter and that you could hear all of what's been said and what is going on in the world and acknowledging God's place and God's role in the world. And I think that this, this prayer is just so beautiful in that because instead of just saying, God, I'm scared, fix it. He's saying, God, you are awesome and mighty. And I know that you are all powerful. I know that you are the only one who can truly deliver us. And the Assyrians don't know. They're very confused. And more than that, they're trampling on your name. And, and we just get this sense that he is just so upset about the way God is being treated by the Assyrians. And that is the content of his prayer. And I love this Re almost reflexive response he has when he's faced with this time of trial. He's faced with this letter that's threatening and his re first response is to go to God. And that, that doesn't just all of a sudden happen. That, that is a, a response that takes years of choosing to respond to God where it doesn't matter whether it's good or bad or, in, or anything that our first response is that reflexive, that this is what's going on. And our first thing to do is to respond and talk to God about it and say, God, look, this is what it is. And just lay it all out there. It's such a, a beautiful picture. And so then after that, we get Isaiah comes and he talks to Hezekiah and we have this whole section. And he reassures Hezekiah that the Lord is indeed going to destroy Assyria and that they will not get away with their blasphemous words and treating God in the way that they they are. And so that, that's what we get in this section. And then uh, we come to our second part of our text for today, which is 30 through 35, Isaiah 37, 
verses 30 through 35. And we get God's response to Hezekiah and a part of it, because we already have the first part of the response, which is saying Assyria is not going to survive much longer. They have already been judged and they will be destroyed. But then in verse 30, God um, says that he's going to give Hezekiah a sign. So let's go ahead and read this section and then we'll talk about it. This will be the sign for you, Hezekiah. This year you will eat what grows by itself and the second year what springs from that. But in the third year, sow and reap, plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Once more, a remnant of the, ki the kingdom of Judah will take root below and bear fruit above. For out of Jerusalem will come a remnant, and out of Mount Zion, a band of survivors. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Therefore, this is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with shield or build a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, he will return. He will not enter this city, declares the Lord. I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. So God is going to give Hezekiah a sign, but it's not a sign that is going to be that moment. It's a sign that is going to be something that they will be able to look back on and say, yeah, see that God did say that that was what was going to happen. So God tells Hezekiah that this year you're going to not be able to plant crops. They're, they're, Sennacherib and the Syrians are going to leave, but you're not going to be able to plant crops in the land. But there is going to be things that grow, crops that grow that you will be able to eat just that will grow naturally. And then in the second year, they're going to say, he says that that's going to happen again. It's still not going to be time to plant crops. They're still going to be transitioning out of being under the Assyrians. But in the third year, you'll be able to plant crops and you'll be able to plant vineyards. And vineyards aren't something that can just be planted um, in a very tumultuous, tumultuous season. They really need to be planted whenever the land is at peace because they take so much care. That was what one of the commentators I read was talking about how a vineyard is very much a peace plant, a uh, peace crop, because it does require a lot of care to produce um, grapes that will um, be really good and um, fruitful. And um, I thought that was just so interesting. So he's saying in the third year, you're going to be able to, to actually plant crops and not just plant whatever crops, but plant some that are going to really take time and care and that you're going to need to tend to and care for. Um, and that, and so we have this promise of deliverance and we have a sign. And we talked a few weeks ago about how signs don't, uh, it, when we have the signs here, they don't, they're not made to create faith. They're meant to uh, promote it, to um, help, to show how God has moved and is moving. But they don't create faith in and of themselves. The faith already has to be there. But they reassure us in those, through those hard times. The signs can reassure us. Um, and so we have this picture that God is going to deliver Judah and that Assyri the Assyrians are going to leave. And not just leave, they're going to be destroyed. And the chapter 37 ends with the rest of the story of how the Assyrian army um, loses um, 185,000 troops um, in, at, at the hand of the angel of the Lord. And then further on, which causes Sennacherib to go ahead and leave and return to Nineveh. And then um, it ends by saying that Sennacherib eventually is killed by his sons, and um, which is just terrible. And the Assyrian Syrians are no more a threat. And so we see this picture and this picture of God's deliverance, the promise of his deliverance, and then the reassurance here. And um, that's, I just think it's so interesting. We get both I, the Hezekiah's prayer and we get God's response to his prayer and how um, God really does care and really does work um, in and through the events of history, through the world history. And um, I think that 
Hezekiah, we see Hezekiah responding correctly to the question of, are you going to trust God? Or are you going to trust the other nations for help? And he chooses to trust God. And uh, even though he wasn't perfect and he didn't make all right 100% of the time decisions, but he does choose to trust God and he was faithful and led the people to do the same. So I think that what one of the things that I'm left with out of this is how am I at turning to God reflexively? So is my response to God a reflex? Like I'm, if something happens in my life um, that's maybe not good, am I, is God the one I'm turning to first or am I turning to something else? Um, but even further than that, am I only turning to God when times are difficult or am I also turning to him when times are good or even more, am I turning to him on the days that just feel mundane? And there's nothing really special and there's nothing really terrible, but I'm just going through the motions. Am I still returning to God? Am I returning to those, those, um, do I have those deep ruts of deep habits of faith in my life? Or am I being uh, blown about just as um, like a wave on the ocean? Am I just blown and tossed about? Or am I be, do I have deep faith that will sustain Stay, will, that will sustain me through all of life's, life's seasons. Because life isn't just about good times and bad times. There's so much of our time is lived in the mundane and in the ordinary. So are we trusting God in those ordinary times as well? So I hope that this has continued to be a really beneficial study for you this fall. I know it has been very good for me and refreshing um, just to read through Isaiah and to consider these ancient words and what um, those words might have to say to us today in our time. So I hope your conversations this week are great in your small groups and I'll see you next week. Bye.